In dealing with Beijing, President Yoon has been stuck between a rock and a hard place. Unlike his predecessor, who pursued policy of strategic ambiguity aimed at maintaining a diplomatic balance between the U.S. and China, President Yoon has had to lean towards Washington. Seoul has explained that the move is not aimed at exclusion of a specific country. But how does Beijing interpret Seoul's position? There are speculations of retaliation. Could it be reminiscent of the Thad crisis? For further analysis on the Seoul-Beijing relations, we connect with Professor Kim Byung-ju at the Hankook University of Foreign Studies. Good morning, Professor Kim. Good morning. And thank you for joining us despite the extended holiday. <laughs> oh, thank you for having me. My, my pleasure. <laughs> Let's jump into the deep end of this poll. So speculations are about whether China is reintroducing retaliations against Korea, possibly repeating what their stance uh, was since 2016 surrounding the THAAD issue. So what are some of the key developments that claim to support such speculations? I think such speculations have uh, enough foundation being observed, whether we do agree with the uh, observation or not. The uh, foundation being uh, the Chinese official media say, saying very, very aggressive words. In mm-hmm. fact, following uh, President Yoon's uh, latest you know, state visit, uh, recent state visit to the United States, and his, uh, you know, uh, attendance at the G7 meeting in um, you know, Hiroshima and also uh, meeting with, summit with uh, Japanese prime minister and so on. The Chinese, pri- Chinese official media has been unprecedented. I mean, they've been always harsh uh, when there are issues and uh, they are known for their bullying. But the level of expression uh, and aggression and everything uh, reached another level this time. Mm-hmm. And they were saying... You know, Korea is, uh, the, you know, the United States colony, and uh, Korea is just a small uh, piece of a stone on the gold play, and, uh, you know, all, all this unacceptably, you know, the degrading words being mm-hmm. used to describe uh, Korea and to dis- to, to criticize Korea. So, so we see enough of evidence on the side of Chinese government being uh, angry and anxious and perhaps even nervous about Korea's moves. So mm. uh, if we relate that to any other moves on the industry side, I think there's enough ground to, to have spe- such speculation. Uh, so <clears throat> recently there have been many, uh, you know, several such cases. For example, Korea's neighbor internet service. The thing is, uh, ever since 2016-17, thought uh, retaliation, uh, you know, neighbor blog and other services were blocked, but at least the uh, neighbor search and neighbor mail uh, email service, uh, they were uh, accessible in China, but mm. but uh, they they it's being reported that their accessibility in China in recent days have been kind of compromised in mm. some of the key cities like Beijing and Shenzhen, you know, in some of the areas close to Korea here. So, uh, you know, the, the, the internet is definitely clearly public domain uh, particularly <laughs> in China right. you know China has control over uh, internet and they block a lot of different services so so when uh, something happens on the internet we can't help ourselves speculate this is the the government orchestrated action mm-hmm. and some of the entertainers uh, from Korea their uh, you know programs and their appearances in their shows uh, have been cancelled mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. so in in those actions, uh, you know, the people are saying, oh, is this the, the old repetition of what happened uh, several years ago mm-hmm. with regard to terminal high altitude uh, missile defense system, FAD, mm-hmm. case here or not? Uh, enough of actions mm-hmm. and uh, speculations, but uh, there have been some other uh, counter arguments from uh, the other side as well, though. Because we do remember the local culture and tourism industry being especially hit hard in the aftermath of the THAAD crisis and the mm-hmm. recent indication of censorship, as you mentioned, with the Internet searches and TV program appearances being canceled. We're seeing certainly some overlaps there. So it's perhaps safe for us to make that correlation. But just to be fair, and we cover all uh, extent, to Mm -hmm. what extent can we say these developments support the idea that the Chinese government is orchestrating such maneuvers to specifically Mm -hmm. give 
only Korea a hard time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this time, particularly, there is uh, much question about that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, there are different uh, grounds uh, on this side of the argument, mm-hmm. too. But, uh, one is observers are looking at what's happening to, for example, I mentioned what happened to Korean entertainers, but they're looking at uh, entertainers from other countries, and they see uh, you know, very uh, similar signs. Mm-hmm. For example, a Japanese uh, art performer, Uh, his performance being canceled. Mm-hmm. Taiwanese band, uh, their scheduled uh, performance shows were canceled. Uh, so they're saying possibly what's happening here is that with the reopening in China after COVID period, uh, the government uh, authorities, regulators and uh, monitors, and, and they're quite nervous and they are tightening up their grip on Uh, what's happening on their side. So censorship, for sure. Mm. Uh, the level of censorship is is on the rise. So they say uh, in, in this overall trend, the trend itself is also clear that, you know, censorship is being being tightened in at all fronts, you know, whether you're a Korean performer or not in cultural and, and uh, entertainment s- sphere. So uh, there is no strong evidence that this is really specifically uh, uh, targeted uh, on Korea. And also, uh, you know, there are other, uh, you know, observations, uh, such as uh, the the perspective that argues that China doesn't really have as much of ammunition in their in their position anymore in terms of hitting back South Korea. They they have kind of used up all they could, uh, mm. not necessarily all, but much of what they got in terms of, you know, punishing uh, Korea for over the past several years mm. uh, because of the thought and And uh, they they cannot really make much difference uh, additionally on top of what have have happened for the past several years. So they don't really have much left in their in their position. Uh, uh-huh. Some people argue, and so that I think it's a very uh, important point. And re- with uh, relating to that point is another observation saying that even inside China, even policymakers and officials, uh, Korean observers sense that there is a view that uh, China didn't do the right thing with regard to thought and it uh. has uh, reduced in a way uh, that their, their sphere of interest, uh, influence in a way. And so uh, there are a lot of second thoughts about mm. repeating what they did with regard to thought this mm. time to Korea only because Korea is having the summit meetings and then you know showing, announcing new stances Uh, closer stances with uh, Washington and and Tokyo. So so overall, you know, um, the the picture seems to, seems to be quite mixed. Different mm. perspective on both sides. Because as you've rightfully pointed out in a segment several times before, Dr. Kim, mm-hmm. it is that no single country is monolithic, and to have those mm-hmm. observations from all angles seems to be important. And the fact that mm-hmm. maybe the retaliation, if they were to be pursued further this time around, should be maybe differentiated from the THAAD crisis. But right. maybe there is right. something to be learned in history to answer the question of whether China has the intention to economically bully South Korea again or not, it may depend mm-hmm. on a lot of how the past worked. How well did the THAAD retaliation work? I don't think anyone finds any strong argument either in China or South Korea that China's THAAD retaliation actually worked. Mm. Uh, uh, we know what they did and uh, most of their actions were focused on consumer goods such as cosmetics and also uh, tourism. Mm. Uh, we don't know, it's hard, we'll have to be hard pressed to come up with an argument about what China did on the on the major big, uh, you know, the industrial supply related businesses and so on. Mm. So to begin with, I mean, major, major heavy industries and And big industries, of course, cosmetics is big, tourism is important and everything. But still, you know, there is no strong argument that those real big areas of Korean industry have been hit by the thought retaliation to begin with. And uh, and then what they afford to hit were these uh, consumer related and tourism related side. And to what extent uh, did it really hurt? Uh, it really hurt a retail, a retail business like Lotte and cosmetic business like America Pacific and 
and, uh, and then other some of the big giant businesses were affected. But still, it's difficult that uh, to say that Chinese government actually showed what they could uh, to Korea's biggest economic players. Actually, Korea's biggest ex- biggest ex- economic players like Samsung and Hyundai, not necessarily uh, because of the thought retaliation, but over the years because of China's ambition mm-hmm. to reduce their their reliance on Korea. Uh, you know, Samsung and Hyundai have seen their presence in China. Chinese market shrinking uh, consistently over um, over a decade, mm-hmm. uh, decade and a half or whatever, and so uh, we already saw you know those Korea's presence, business presence, market presence, they're shrinking not because of that but for other reasons. So altogether, uh, again, you know, I don't think we we seen anyone making persuasive argument that actually thought retaliation worked. It only increased Korea's negative feeling towards Korea, pushed uh, South Korea away from China, right. uh, it's difficult to say that uh, China gained anything really. I mean, you know, like if you want to bully someone, uh, you know, like, a, you know, uh, 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 kind of like airing the possibility of threat works, but when you actually take an action, actually it reduces, as I mentioned before, the, the ammunition mm-hmm. uh, analogy. And once you use it, you run out of it, and mm-hmm. you don't have, have anything more. So, so it was a failure to say the least mm, you're right because maybe what it what it resulted in is is this uh, negative feelings uh, towards china especially by the young south koreans and i'm not quite mm-hmm. sure if that's what china had calculated that's not necessarily mm-hmm. retaliation that benefits the country uh, they, they want it right, cause right. fear but they right. instead it causes anger <laughs> so as you rightfully point out, using that ammunition as opposed to hanging the ammunition as a thread is mm-hmm. is entirely different. Um, right. Here's another question, Dr. Kim. Uh, there was an announcement saying that there might be a plan for the two leaders of South Korea and China to sit down regularly. It was back in November, for instance, at the Bali summit with Xi Jinping, President Yoon, saying that they will meet regularly that hasn't been happening. Um, what do we see in Seoul's effort for managing its Beijing ties now? I think uh, as much as Seoul has been uh, working hard to, to strengthen ties with Washington and, and Tokyo, on the side of it, uh, Seoul never ceased uh, to uh, work on you know uh, its relationship with Beijing for sure. Mm. As you mentioned, uh, back in November when uh, uh, President Yoon met with Xi Jinping for the first time in, in Bali, uh, Indonesia, at the occasion of G20 uh, summit. You know, they had bilateral summit for the first time, and they agreed on the idea. Well, the President Yoon proposed the idea of regular, you know, making summit uh, take have it take place regularly. And Xi Jinping uh, counter offered, made a counter offer while agreeing, according to. Presidential offices uh, statement. Uh, Xi Jinping agreed with the President Yoon's idea, and then also proposed that the two countries need a 1.5 track uh, dialogue, meaning you know not only government but private sector. Probably this is a recognition that you know the thought retaliation caused a lot of anger in the public sector, uh, private sector here in Korea, and so that's why Xi Jinping was proposing it. But so there are a lot of ideas, uh, mm. you know, exchanged uh, in November, but. Since then, uh, indeed, as you mentioned, not much has been happening. And uh, um, Korea, first of all, is mindful of its plan that uh, it wants to host a Korea-China-Japan summit, trilateral summit uh, here in Korea as a part of the the, the system. We have a trilateral cooperation Mm -hmm. system. We have its secretariat office uh, located here in Seoul. And uh, we want to have trilateral summit take place. Mm-hmm. But uh, not much we heard uh, is taking place in terms of its preparation, even though Korea's plan is to have summit take place before the end of the year. Mm-hmm. But it uh, looks like it's not going ahead very well. And there are other uh, you know, channels being worked on, such as uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Economy, Chung Yong-ho, has uh, reminded uh, Chinese ambassador here in Korea that uh, that Korea is very much committed to the idea of uh, working with China and mm-hmm. having uh, economic ministers meeting is critical and so on. Uh, but but uh, you know uh, the the things are not really taking place. So mm. uh, the, the, what we see in the picture, as you mentioned, is Korea working hard on our side, but mm. 
but China sometimes saying words, uh, but not really following with the with the actions. One thing interesting is of uh, uh, quite a, a few days ago, I think there was an APEC uh, trade minister meeting mm-hmm. in Detroit, United States, mm-hmm. and a Chinese uh, uh, minister of commerce came out quite strongly in a positive way, mm-hmm. saying that Korea China share the same ideas about what how the two countries should work in response to the global supply chain reshuffling and so on. So that was a little bit of unexpectedly yeah. positive response. <laughs> so <laughs> surprised us. So as you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, in this segment, uh, you know, China has its own pluralistic aspect in their system mm. on, on their own. Different people say different words. So uh, <laughs> we are a little bit perplexed and confused, but but many eyes are closely watching at this point what China really will have, uh, will come to conclude or, you know, how it's going to put together its its uh, sense of direction going forward. Because as far as the Indo-Pacific economic framework goes, China and South Korea certainly has mutual interest. Um, mm-hmm. Dr. Kim, I always appreciate uh, you taking the hard questions and highlighting <laughs> this point. Um, what, what are some of the major points for Korea to keep in mind then going forward as we continuously dabble in the delicate balancing act between Beijing and Washington? Uh, yeah, for the past uh, year, since Yoon government came into place, uh, uh, the progressive side of Korean politics have been accusing Yoon government going too far, taking side with the uh, United States and Japan. And they're saying, uh, you know, diplomacy of balance is balancing diplomacy is what we need. Mm. And we need to keep uh, continue to keep a delicate balance between Beijing and Washington and Tokyo. I think uh, what we talked about this morning all together kind of have proven that they were not right. They were, in fact, wrong. Mm-hmm. And what the Korea, South Korean government has done for the past year, in my own view, actually, highs, uh, the, the actually heightened and increased Korea's uh, relevance and, and power mm-hmm. uh, in, in the way it deals with Beijing. Because... Because China has, uh, because Seoul has moved closer to Beijing and Tokyo, uh, China is pressed harder mm. to act uh, somehow. We see all these mixed signals I just mentioned here. Mm. And uh, uh, rather than just uh, kind of sort of serviently keeping quiet and then, you know, saying, not saying anything, uh, stuck in between China and the United States, by taking steps closer to Washington, I think Korea has increased its value. And China has to respect it. Uh, you know, this is what happens in authoritarian countries. When you subser- remain subservient, they treat you very, very lightly, uh, mm. you know, to say the least. Mm. Uh, and uh, here, by taking the steps, I think Korea did the right thing. And this is what we have to do. And then many, uh, there is, seems to be a kind of consensus emerging inside Korea saying now, okay, we had to work on strengthening ties with Washington and Tokyo first. Mm. By doing so, we gain much ground to improve relationship with Beijing next. Mm. And that's where we stand at this point, step by step, uh, you know, uh, follow, you know, different sequence and, and, and we are doing the right thing. I think that's the consensus. We have done the right thing so far. Mm. And now, uh, you know, we don't want to be enemy of China. We want to reach out to China. Mm. And when we reach out to China, it's always better. We have a strong backing uh, in our bag, United States and and Japan, and by doing so, when we reach out to China, we uh, you know we be- our arguments become more persuasive, ah. and uh, that's where we stand and at at the moment. And I think that you know that observation has a lot of uh, consensus behind us. So um, mm. I want to end uh, today's talk with a little bit of optimism here. A little bit of optimism. We appreciate it, Doctor Kim. We <laughs> could certainly use it. Uh, enjoy your Monday, and we'll speak to you again next week. Thank you very much. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.